Pardon the interruption. I'm Chris Garrett, joined by Amy Popping God. Amy, we are almost done with CWBC. We CWBC. are. I cannot believe even believe it. it. I cannot. Half, halfway through Unit 3, and let me just point out, this webisode is going up July 23rd. By this time next week, they'll have taken the last test in CWC and we'll be working on the last assignment. So it let, feels like we start slow, and yeah. then all of a sudden it's just well, so off to the races. Well, so here's my question. Unit yep. 3 is different in that it just flies by, yes. right? It's mm -hmm. only, I mean, it's the, the fewest number of assignments, but there's still a lot of material to cover here. So what advice do you have for students as they finish with this kind of breakneck pace of Unit 3? I think that what tends to happen is that by the end, people are running out of steam mm -hmm. a little bit. And as you just said, you're running out of steam as actually things pick up. So the challenge I tend to see is that you're just now kind of at a point where if you've gotten a little bit behind, now it's just like, turn it out, turn it out, turn it out. I, I, I tend to see answers getting a little bit shorter, a yeah. little bit more cursory. Don't do that. Like we, um, if anything, it's actually like, I think, at this point, we expect more nuanced answers, more thoughtful answers, that you have listened to advice that's been given to you all along the way of saying, use the sources, speak to the sources, make a good argument, address all of the questions. So I think that the, the, the advice actually is kind of still, it's, it's the same, but it's like you just need to give get the reminder, stay strong, keep making the time, because especially as you move towards the, the, the final parts of the course with, um, needing to do your like exit or, like take the time to give thoughtful thoughtful answers it's not just about checking the boxes we are looking much more carefully at you know what you need to do by now so please so please do it and don't and also i think there's a tendency to sort of discount the info you know it's like all the stuff at the end and it's like it's actually oh, super yeah, important yeah, so yeah. pay pay i'm um, really just be thoughtful about like what we're studying and thinking about how it shapes our current context mm -hmm. yeah i mean i think maybe it's worth just saying a little bit of why it's designed because this is a big difference from the face-to-face -face yeah. course where each unit is basically so partly it's kind of psychologically what you said which is students run out of steam at yep. the end of the course and we wanted to kind of acknowledge that and say okay so we get gonna, it yeah it's but... only going to be a few days instead of a couple weeks but you still need to keep up with yeah that. um the second piece is just there's there's less time being covered right like the you know the first two units are each like a millennium and now we get to the end and even when we backtrack to copernicus it's still basically 300 maybe a little bit more time so we are rushing through it but as we'll talk more about in the last webisode it is important, partly because it's encapsulating a lot of things, it's synthesizing a lot of things, but it's also pushing us forward to the next stage of gen ed. So we'll talk more about that uh, um, in the next one. Since scientific revolution is obviously such an important part of unit three, if you had to pick just one scientific revolution term or, re or reading rather that you want students to master, which is it? Well, I, I want to talk so about Pascal ones. and the Pensee, but I know that you and Sam are going to talk about that when we play make, when you two play Make the Case. In segment two, so I'll punt that off. And instead, okay. I'll talk about Galileo and his mm. letter to Christina. So um, I'll start actually here. A few years ago, I think the honors program had a Nobel laureate physicist named William Phillips come in to give a talk that I went to. And uh, it was fascinating because as I listened to him talk about how his faith, as I think he goes to a Methodist church yep. in Maryland, as his faith relates to his work as a world-class brilliant physicist, it sounded like Galileo which is mm. almost like, well, there are different questions being asked, right? Some questions pertain to, how to essentially the old version of physics, right? The physical world. How do we answer questions about the nature of how planets orbit and rotate and how our bodies work and the elements that compose the physical world? And those should be answered in one way, but then I've got these other questions and we might call them spiritual questions or metaphysical questions. They go beyond the physical world and they should be answered in a different sort of way. And so to him, there was no tension at all between his life as a Christian, his life as a man of science. And that was his way of doing it. And it's very familiar because that's Galileo's solution. Right, Galileo's solution is not to say, well, just because you know I think you've misread Psalm 93 about the world is firmly established, it can't be moved. I'm not going to say, so get rid of the Bible. I'm going to say you are misusing the Bible for the purposes for which it's intended. Yeah. Right? The Holy Bible is true as long as we understand what it's trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And I find it a pretty powerful yeah. way of dealing with some of the upheaval that's already starting to brew that um, I think we're still wrestling with, which is to say, I, think, I always feel it's a little bit like Luther, right? That God has ordained these two different kingdoms for different purposes. Well, God has given two different books. You know, the Bible is given to help us answer spiritual questions, but God has also given us the book of nature, 
right? And he has written laws, and our job is to try to understand them. The final piece, and the one that always bothers students when I talk about in small group, is Galileo is super elitist, right? Yeah. He says, but, you know. This, this is for thinking people. This is mm. for thinking folk, right? Like, you <laughs> ignorant, unlearned folks would never understand that, so we need specialists. We need yeah. theologians for one set of questions, but we also now need scientists for another set of questions. And that has some problems to think yeah. about, too. But that, you know, I think it's worth thinking about, yeah. at least. Yeah, no, for sure. Mm. So you might want to think about that, then, as you write your uh, next discussion post, your last discussion post. We're going to take a break here. This is not so much about um, history as about your own personal history, right? Yeah. So in your next discussion post, Amy, what are they going to do? They're going to reflect on some you're of gonna, experience. You're going to reflect on your own experience with science classes. Um, and so you're going to think about, like, how do you engage this question? Uh, what is a, um, and uh, again, like make sure you watch this whole episode because it's something that's going to come up when um, Sam and I do make the case. But think about like, what is the relationship for a Christian between um, reason, rationale, that which we can't understand, that which cannot be observed? How is that, how is that played out in your science classes, in your experience? Um, and maybe that has to do with how you were raised, have there ever been conflicts for you? We know that at Bethel we have many students who um, are majoring in the sciences and it's really great to actually get their perspective on the ways in which either their science classes here at Bethel or comparing that experience with previous experiences in science classes has caused them to really think about this question because it's a question you need to have an answer for. You need to be able to articulate what you think about it. So um, Chris, to get us started, what was your experience with science in high school and college? Hmm. Well, in high school it was really fascinating. Um, you know, I, I, I had a chance to take great science classes at my school, uh, but more importantly, my dad was a medical researcher yeah. at that point in his career, and for two summers after my junior and senior year of high school, I got to work as a lab tech at a biomedical research center at Children's Hospital in St. Paul. So I got to do science. I went to a Nobel Forum at Gustavus Adolphus College with, um, I think it's Bob Gallo, is one of the people hmm. who figured out HIV. Yeah. So I, it was like immersive. It was good for me, partly because I had given some thought to, my dad was a doctor, my mom was a nurse, my, I have an uncle who's an astrophysicist. I had given some thought to that, and I realized mostly I don't ever want to do that, and I want to do the <laughs> humanities instead, which is why my college experiences, I took an intro to bio class, and that was it, and I said goodbye. goodbye. Which has really <laughs> deprived me. The body is a mystery, and we like it that and way. And it tells me my undergraduate <laughs> alma mater had a worse gen ed curriculum than ours does, because you all actually have to do more stuff. Yeah. But what was interesting was my dad was a world class, and I really mean this completely honestly and modestly on his part. Like he was a world class yeah. researcher. He has since gone into other things, but like he co-authored hundreds of articles, literally, on something called human cytomegalovirus. At the same time, dad was a very devout, in some ways, kind of fundamentalist Christian. Mm. Like I, I didn't know it at the time, but I would now call dad a young Earth creationist who is suspicious of evolution. And yet, deeply committed to the work of science, and at yeah. least in his realm, the craft of science, the community that built up around science, and the way to ask questions. And, you know, I would guess, like, if I kind of talked him through Galileo's reading, he'd probably say something similar. At that point in my life, it was just a time of tension, though. Like, I didn't go to a Christian high school. I didn't go to Bethel to work through these things. And so I was kind of left with, I don't know how to resolve this, because I could observe well, I see you doing the science, but you're so suspicious of science for other reasons. Uh, how does this all fit together? And that was really a big struggle for me in my faith for a long time, is how do I resolve this tension that I'm observing? Because, you know, my teachers at Mounds Park Academy weren't there to help me right, with that. Right. And my pastors at church weren't very interested in talking about yeah. it. So that, that's what I would write about. But we'll look forward to reading what you all have to write about it. Amy, you mentioned Make the Case. You're about to play Make the Case against our friend Sam here. So I'm going to help you warm up. This is not going to be one of the questions for it, but this will help you kind of get the, uh, the the motor running. Make the case for the Enlightenment as the most important time period that we study in this course. Well, even though you'll hear the phrase thrown around, like we live in postmodern, blah, 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 we still live in the age of the Enlightenment. I mean, in, in, in my opinion, in that the things that you're going to study and the ways that we're going to see this connection between how, okay, how do we take what we're observing in science? How do we take what we are sort of proving to be true? And yet, how is that going to impact what we uh, think in terms of religion and the impact of religion and the role of religion? And how do, you, how do you reconcile those? What does it mean to be a thinking person? How do we think about human rights? How do we think about um, uh, the, like human beings' relationships to one another? So many of these good questions that are being asked during the Enlightenment, we are still, um, we're still asking those same questions, but yet the answers that we come to are what I feel like we're continuously working out really haven't changed. I mean, like what it looks like has changed, but when you look at a figure and 
Um, my, my friends certainly know I'm a big fan of John Wesley because of the sort of Wesleyan approach, the um, quadrilateral, this, this method of saying, how do I reconcile being a thinking person with being a person who's faithful to, you know, who I believe Jesus Christ to be and what I believe in Christianity. And it's like, well, it's faith and reason together. It's mm -hmm. relying on scriptural tradition, but it's also saying, what role does my experience play? And so that, I, I think you can actually sort of take that idea, like what's the, what is the role of experience and what is the role of the tradition and how do I live that out? And that to me is the enlightenment encapsulated. We also need to be able to critique the enlightenment mm -hmm. because again, kind of to your point about what you were saying about Galileo um, and kind of being, um, you know, an elitist in a way, um, we're going to read the, we, we read these figures in the enlightenment and we read about you know concepts of democracy and we concepts of human rights and it's like but not for everybody and and that was not the author's thought and that wasn't the author's intention so um, it's going to take a long time for um, slavery to be abolished and many of those defending slavery are also going to do so from relying upon their Christian religion in order to do that so but that's actually kind of an enlightenment thing again it's like the ability to be a big part of thinking is critiquing one's thinking mm -hmm. as you are, are going along and sort of human checking each other and so don't ignore it we still live in it like the enlightenment in some respects all of our time periods are important, but the Enlightenment's like where it's all crashing together, but we're, we're still living in the mix of all of it. Well, I think maybe that's what we meant about how don't kind of short this. No, list, you know? like I this mean. This is in some ways where all these, these questions should be like, come boom, together. Boom, 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 yeah, you know. You and, don't leave um, you in an easy place without answering. No. I mean, I'd say the only reason we didn't put that question and make the case is that we're kind of, the webisode comes in the middle of our coverage yeah. of the Enlightenment. Because you so you're just not heard done the yet. setup, yeah. in the next film, you're going to hear more about what Amy just hinted at with the tensions around uh, Enlightenment philosophers' attitudes about women and about persons of color. And we'll talk more about the religious revival that went on under people like Wesley and Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield. So kind of stay tuned. Yeah. We're gonna start pointing to some of the problems with the Enlightenment and then they'll move us into the modern age and your last museum. I sure am feeling ready to make the case now. Okay, good luck, Get Sam. ready, Sam. <laughs> we're back. Amy, it is time for Make the Case. Time to Make the Case. This is the last time we're gonna play Make the Case in uh, Summer CWC. Yeah. All right, mm. we have a set of questions here. We have sealed answers. Amy, what is the first question? The first question is, true or false, Isaac Newton is the single most important person we talk about in this course. All right, Amy, we're going to go with Great. true first. We'll see who gets true. That would be me. Oh, you didn't even let me. You like, Sorry. what's the point of me doing this? <laughs> well, maybe it says something other than false. Maybe I did this wrong. Nope. It does not. <laughs> All right. It does say a, a unpredicted fortune will come your That's way. That's right. So, uh, <laughs> so here's why Isaac Newton's the most important person that we study. I want to make sure to get this question right in this course. Um, and that is because uh, Newton is so foundational to the scientific revolution, to shaping the, not, not just the sciences, not just how we understand the sciences. I mean, he is a, a genius in terms of that. Um, I mean, even though obviously science has advanced since the late 1600s, uh, it's still, I mean, Newton talked about himself standing on the shoulders of giants, and there are giants standing on the shoulders of Newton. He is the new, the new colossus, the new giant, right, at that point. But also, not just in terms of science, but in terms of shaping the, um, shaping the Enlightenment. That, that scientific worldview bleeds out of purely science and it shapes the way we understand reality, which makes him in that way just this crucial to sort of our general philosophy, right? That, that I mean, we talked last uh, episode or uh, last unit about mysticism and like, you know, if, uh, if your roommate came to you and said, oh, I just had this vision, right? Your first response wouldn't be, clearly God's talking to you. You would have a, you would, I would think, you would tend to have this sense of, well, there's gotta be an explanation. Right, having this kind of rational explanation, scientific explanation, I mean, that really is the world that we live in, uh, in the West, in the 20th, 21st century, and Newton is, a, a, is the crucial figure for making that flip, for saying this is the end of the old way, and this is, this is, this is the new way. Even if he didn't know he was doing it entirely, that's why. Okay. Like any good debater, I am going to choose to find a flaw with the question as opposed to your answer. <laughs> well so the, the question is, Isaac Newton, or the, the, the question that we're the debating, true or false, Isaac Newton is the single most important person we talk about in this course, mm -hmm. right? So that kind of indicates like, oh, well, like we should just start with Isaac Newton and everything else we do after that is just really, or everything we should do before is somehow like going to be critiqued in the figure that is Isaac Newton. I don't deny the importance of Isaac Newton. However, is he the single most important person we talk about in 
in the entire course. I'm just going to argue no. I mean, like if you've watched any of these segments, if you've watched um, any of when we um, are doing, um, what do we call it? Food chain? <laughs> what do we call the other one? Like we make a, like what we're trying to do in this course is to say, we're teaching you the importance of Western history. We're looking at the significance of figures in Western history and how we got to where we are. But we're also doing that in conjunction with saying, how has Christianity, which we consider to be this huge shaping force in our own lives, as well as in the story, like, well, where's, where are the Christian figures then and how this plays out? Now, while nothing that Newton's going to do or say somehow like devalues um, the, the core of the importance of what's been happening in Christianity, and to your point, gives us something to then actually measure and to say, how do we relate, say, mystical experiences we have with the reality of what we can hold them up against to understand them or how we can observe them? Like, I can't sit here and say, yep, you're right. Isaac Newton is more important than talking about Martin Luther. Isaac Newton is more important than talking about Augustine. Isaac Newton is more, we do talk about Jesus Christ in this course and so I just I There's have to, the hammer right there, there. It is boom <laughs> students are you gonna vote against that like you know so I um I the significance of Isaac Newton hundred percent boom absolutely like I I agree most important person in the course not a good approach to See, teaching and, history <laughs> and, and I want to say I want to say well done there because the question does not ask you to say who do you think is no it, it doesn't it doesn't say it just apart. says do we agree do we disagree well played Thank question you. number two yes. uh, <laughs> which is more important which is a more important problem for Christians in the scientific age to submit everything to reason or to offend the principles of reason you can go first David. okay and I'll let you even display your answer first thank you it's literally the least I could do. Okay. Okay, so I have submit everything to reason. So what I'm making an argument for is that the more problematic, okay, um, issue for Christians is to submit everything to reason. I think, again, like this, this one kind of makes its own case. If you have been listening to what we've had to say about the importance of personal experience and paying attention to that, which is mystical. Let's really be thoughtful about the word mystical. I think sometimes that word in our modern context, we can just completely dismiss it as like, you believe in ghosts um, or something like that. And rather to me, what is mystical is that which cannot be explained. And um, so I just even wanna like use the simple example of how do we reconcile the relationship between say something like praying for somebody who is suffering from illness and does that actually have an impact on their ability to fight off illness or what the actual end up result is in um, that person's sort of life or death type of situation. While there isn't hard evidence to suggest that like being a person who has a religion, and I wouldn't want to offend anybody because I think it's a very sensitive topic, but that like we can somehow um, overcome and actually defeat illness through the power of something like prayer. As a Christian, I just simply cannot be comfortable with the idea that therefore prayer is null and void because we can't prove that prayer actually has any kind of impact on our lives, that prayer improves anything. Um, when I think about the role of mysticism actually um, and spiritual personal experience with God as a form of like solidarity. So it's like part of me caring about you is not something that can be determined and it's not something that can be proven if we were to try to like describe our friendship. It's not always that in which is observable. It's something that, is, that isn't fully understood and yet is understood by each of us. And I think that that so gets lost when we operate by a system that says like, well, if we can't prove it with reason and rationale, then it has absolutely no place. Because again, to me, and I know this kind of tends to be my default argument, to me, like a common denominator actually across edu across education in this society, across socioeconomic status in this society, across like um, things like, you know, levels of varying ability slash disability in this society, like where we can often find solidarity with other humans and empathy and compassion with other humans is outside of that which is rational and reasonable. So and I, have, I think it's a problem. Right. I have offend reason that that is the bigger problem if we offend the principles of reason. Um, and I think, I agree with everything that you said, because in truth, I think both of these are problems. That's what, I mean, that's what um, Pascal is saying, right? So it's sort of which is more. Uh, and I was given this one to argue, so I'm going to argue it. Um, and I want to think about what Descartes is doing. Uh, now, Descartes, or Pascal really is highly critical of Descartes. And, I, and I'm going to be highly critical of Descartes while I'm trying to defend him at the same time. Descartes' concern... Like any good father. Right. <laughs> Descartes' concern is that, are we going to be able to communicate faith in the marketplace of ideas if the thing that the marketplace of ideas values is reason? Right? So he's saying we need... He, he desperately wants to build this foundation of reason under faith. Now, 
I would argue what Pascal is really saying is that Descartes goes too far by saying we have to sort of, th I mean, because Descartes' project is throw out everything we can doubt, right? That's sort of what you're talking about. It's like that, you know, like 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 that idea of like if 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 we can doubt it or question it, then we have to throw it out. That's the problem with with what Descartes is doing. The idea of saying we need to value reason, we need to have reason be very important. The fact of the matter is, in living in the 20th, 21st century, and I think probably going forward, uh, and even even before the scientific revolution our capacity to reason is a fundamental part of our experience of reality in this world. So to offend that like, creates a discontinuity in our understanding of the world. So I think we need to try to make sure that reason plays a central role. Now it doesn't mean at the same time that there aren't things that are transrational, right? that, that go beyond reason. And that's what I love about Pascal is Pascal is saying we need to not offend the principles of reason, but we need to also understand that there are other ways of knowing, right? He talks about the knowledge in the heart is just a different kind of knowledge. But I do think that if we were to entirely cast off the idea of reason, we would separate ourselves from the main tool with which we experience the world and with which we communicate our experiences. So I think we need to hold tightly to that as well. Um, I'm not sure I'm making a great case here, but but I think I think that that is that is a huge problem, especially if you want to think about how do we communicate faith, right? That reason is part of how we communicate. Reason is part of how we experience the world. If if you're a person of faith, and I am to use Descartes' word, the infidel, right, the person without faith, you your capacity to use reason to help communicate with me those things which are. Um, impossible to encapsulate in words, right? Like, like that's that's a really important tool. Now that might move us to transrational things, but I think reason is a is a huge part of it. Do that. you think it's fair to say like reason is yes? To into your point, how we communicate faith to me, like being open to not submitting everything to reason is how I come closer to God and how mm -hmm. I, you know, yeah. So. I can only communicate what I've experienced to right, some extent. Right. So, but, 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 but I think, I think to, to talk to the person without faith, I think to totally throw off reason makes it, in, makes it a really, or to, well, yeah, to, to throw off all the, the yeah. makes it really hard to create a touchstone with that person to be able to communicate. I think reason creates the foothold to move to those trans Right, things. and to comfort and encourage the person who does have faith I have to be able to do the opposite. Absolutely, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what Pascal is saying. I mean, I think yeah. we both actually deeply agree Which with Which is why we both have kids named Pascal. That's right. <laughs> Last question, uh, a little bit of role playing here. One of us will be Thomas Aquinas, one of us will be Martin Luther. Mm. If we were shown- I ben like Aquinas' hair better. <laughs> if we were shown Ben Franklin's list of five essential religious beliefs, Ben Franklin being a, a deist, uh, mm -hmm. what belief would, would we be most upset by? What the, excuse me, the omission which, of which Right, belief. would be a, yes. Yeah, what's, what do yeah. we say is most missing? Here's your character. Here's mine. Do you want to go first or second? No, I'll go second. I always All right. You have such a clean way of if student the pile. Your pile says a lot about you, and mine says a lot about me. <laughs> I am Thomas Aquinas. I'm Martin Luther. All right. That's all right. I know where I'm going. <laughs> so I think, in my mind, there are, there are a couple big omissions, and I'm going to assume with Luther, you're going to take one of them that I'm thinking of. So I'm going to say, say the other, which is that we're supposed to do one. Right, right. Okay. So I'm gonna mm -hmm. I'm gonna take I'm gonna take the one which I think fits most with Aquinas. Yeah, great. Um, and I think that that is the fact that Aquinas thinks about faith and reason together. This idea of faith perfects reason, which implies the activity of God in the world, the activity of God with His creation. Okay. So I think when you look at um, when you look at Franklin's religious beliefs, I mean, a big part of it is this deistic idea that God sort of made things and let it go, which to some degree it actually fits pretty well with Aquinas because Aquinas has this high view of reason. reason. I think Aquinas mm -hmm. loves laws of nature kind of things, but I think the part where Aquinas would say, wait, stop, is this notion that God is not active in this world. I mean, Aquinas is, Aquinas is a medieval person, right? In that medieval worldview, God's activity, God's life in this world is such a crucial piece. So I would say for Aquinas, that's, that's the big omission. 
Um, and I'm curious what you, do you have to say. Well, about that's it? interesting because I was gonna I was gonna pick up on it a little bit actually, and the same with Luther, um, in terms of taking the idea of God being um, active in the world to that very human personal level of God being concerned with like the details of daily life, and that like you know for for Franklin, yeah, like this idea of God is helpful. Um, I'm, I'm down with it as long as like you see this as a positive, it, it, it leads to productive, good human behavior. But for Franklin, there's the absence of any of the idea that like God is interested in you personally, like invested in you personally, and that God is in, in a way like God is sort of fighting for you and that God, you should seek God as Luther believes, like in, in very much in the details of daily life. And also, especially this idea, which Franklin would not agree with, we are in need of being saved. There's like the that's the right big there. thing, right? So the idea that like we, we have original sin, we are prone to, um, we, are, we are prone towards evil. Like we are, we are selfish creatures. And no matter what we do to try to sort of bring about, I think like a redemptive peace in ourselves, there is no redemption outside of God gifting it fully to us, placing it over us. And so we are like, to just again, like a simple sentence, we are in need of being saved. And Franklin would not be down with that idea. Yeah, I mean, it is interesting to look at, at both of those things that we touched but on. It, it, yeah, it's a personal piece. The, and and, they, and they actually also touch on early church heresies, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? This idea, I mean, it all comes around. What mm -hmm. you're saying about Luther would be saying, you know, he's a, Franklin's too Pelagian, right? Yeah. So he's saying like, well, if we just oh, figure dude. it out and we can right. do it, right? What I'm saying is a little bit sort of Gnostic in terms of the spiritual God, the, the being this spiritual activity in this world, right? So it is interesting to think about. I'm not sure how you're going to vote on that because I think we both gave really good yeah. answers from those perspectives, but we didn't write the question, so you have to vote on this. So go on to Moodle, mm. uh, pick who you thought won each of these debates, and we'll be right back to wrap up the show. All right, we are almost out of time. Sam, you ready for happy I days? am. Let's start with happy birthday to Harry Potter himself, Daniel. Radcliffe is 30 years old today. That is shocking. I cannot believe that. Sam, of the cast of the Harry Potter series and the Lord of the Rings trilogy, which has collectively had the better post-blockbuster career? This is fascinating. And I, I did a little bit of thinking about this. And to me, it comes down to this. If you, The individual who's had the best career out of either of those casts mm -hmm. post that is Viggo Mortensen. Three best actor oh, nominations. No, yeah, I mean. Three? Three, yep. Um, I think uh, 2008, 2017, or 2016, 2018, or something like that. Yeah. Oh, I, I like. I thought like Green Book was kind of this comeback out of nowhere. I'd nope. forgotten about him. Nope. Yeah. Yeah. So 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 he's the individual because it. Cause, and and I'm saying I'm looking at it this way now. You, if you look at the Harry Potter cast and a little bit at the at the um, Lord of the Rings cast, there are some people who brought their stars with them. Mm -hmm. So like they don't get uh, Emma Thompson and oh. people like that. It's like, because those people, their careers were already off. It's, yeah. it's who got launched by yeah. these things. So, so it, it kind of comes, if you're looking at individuals, it comes down to Emma Watson versus Viggo Mortensen. And Viggo Mortensen, three Oscar nominations, I think. Now, Emma Watson's a lot younger. She right. could push that yeah. a lot further. Yeah. I don't have a lot of hope for the Rupert Grints of the world, but Well, I think we'll Radcliffe is interesting because so much of what he's done has actually been in theater, right. which is probably hard. Which is watch. also an acting excuse for why you're not making great movies. <laughs> yeah. But wow. if you want to look at things more broadly, you could look at Viggo Mortensen versus Game of Thrones. Because if you watch Game of Thrones, there are tons of people from Harry Potter who are in Game of Thrones. So you kind of need to wheel those out. I would argue, I don't know why I turned this in to make the case. No, it's okay. I would argue that the Game of Thrones participation is fairly, there are a lot of kind of smaller roles, things like that. I'm going to give it to Viggo in Lord of the Rings. Okay, I came to the right person. <laughs> All right. Uh, happy anniversary to Telstar. Uh, the satellite that broadcast the first transatlantic TV program this day in 1962. The Walter Cronkite News Report, actually. Well, of course it was. Uh, Chris, what is your favorite TV show from across the pond? So uh, there are a million British shows I talked about here. Like One I'd mentioned that's just six episodes long is Bodyguard, which I think is the best kind of uh, war on terror TV series that's ever been done. Featuring Richard Madden from Game of Thrones. Exactly. Uh, but I will actually go to the continent itself. Um, it's not actually a great show. I just watched a Belgian crime drama called Undercover, which is about drug trafficking in Belgium. And that's just funny, the two of us, because we know someone well who speaks Flemish, who lives in Belgium. And when we were in Belgium in June, we thought about, I thought about that all the time. That's right. But actually, I'll talk about a German show here called Deutschland 83, or should be 
whatever '83 is in German, which is escaping me. It's a Cold War thriller. It's actually made by a husband and wife. Uh, she's American, he's German, I think, or the other way around. But it's about an East German who infiltrates West German NATO kind of intelligence military apparatus. I've actually only seen the first season, but it's continued on. So it's Redland of the Americans, which is my favorite TV show of the last probably five years or so. I love spy dramas. I teach a Cold War class. Um, but it's also a really interesting glimpse into a society we don't think a lot about, which is divided Germany, both East Germany and West Germany. Um, kind of on the eve of all of that falling, communism falling apart in the reunification of Germany. So if you can find Deutschland 83, I'm not sure it's streaming on Amazon or Netflix. I actually saw it in the Iceland air flight theater <laughs> once. <laughs> but actually it, it still, it, it holds up as the best European show I've seen. Okay, well, let's close this with happy trails to President Ulysses S. Grant who died of throat cancer this day in 1885. Sam, historians actually have tended to view Grant much more positively than they did even a couple of generations ago, which recent U.S. president is most likely to go way up or way down as time continues? Again, I have a long answer to this because it's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. And I think you have to, we'll look at like post-Watergate presidents well, in terms of recent. Can I Grant has changed just to kind of set If you would like, sure. For people? So, I mean, I think for a long time, Grant was viewed, it was corruption, right? I mean, like that was what defined the Grant presidency, his treatment of Native Americans, uh, and you know, as someone who's maybe not a great orator, has some personal issues as well. Um, what's really changed is Reconstruction. You know, people have shed some of the old lost cause myth that Reconstruction was this thing inflicted on the South and realized it was a genuine attempt at multiracial democracy that Ulysses S. Grant strongly supported. And because of that, in the wake of the Civil Rights Movement, I think, mm -hmm. because of actually current events, it actually shifts that historical perspective. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so I would think if we're looking at red, red recent from a historical point of view, these would be post-Watergate presidents. Yeah, sure. um, and the, the issue is when you look at all of those, we're increasingly in a, a, a polarized interpretation of these presidents. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking for is who is the person who is going to eventually not only have the side that they're on, but have the other folks uh, won over to them once everybody who was alive at the time is dead and gone. Um, and. I, I, I don't have a particularly high view of Reagan, and I think, I, so I think that, I think he's gonna tend to go down um, where he might be high in some, in, to some people uh, now. I think Clinton is sort of low now and will stay low. I think Bush is low now and will stay low, both Bushes. Um, I actually, so, so it sort of leads me with um, Reagan going down, and I think eventually 100, 150 years from now, Obama will be looked at positively, is, is my guess. Um, and, and that will sort of unify around that, so I that's my he guess. he actually has done, Obama has done pretty well in the most recent historian political scientist polls, which is unusual for such a recent, mm -hmm. post. and there's always recency bias too. Right. I actually might disagree a little bit about the first Bush. And I think it really depends how we emerge from whatever comes after Donald Trump. Because um, it could be the, that our current president has just rewritten the rules of what politics looks like and maybe we just won't agree on what a good president is because he's such a divisive figure in that way. But if we do kind of come out the other end with something more like a recaptured sense of you know, what we think a president is like, I actually think George H.W. Bush might come off a little better than he currently does. If we suddenly um, say as part of a long career personal character, I actually think George H.W. Bush holds up pretty well. Um, I happened to be teaching my Cold War class when he died, mm -hmm. and it was right as we were coming to the end of the Cold War, and it was a really good moment to kind of appreciate the way he handled what could have been a very tense situation. Right, it comes down to how you, how much credit you give him in the role he plays in the end of in the end of the Cold War, or how much was that this sort of inevitability that he well, happened to be? But also, court? just like how much credit do you give someone for simply being a decent person sure. as president? I <laughs> right? feel like that might be a little. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see like if if how much that is an issue of right now. Well, and I, how much I tend to think be. that also redounds to to some extent his son, but also especially to Barack Obama, who I think mm -hmm. was a profoundly decent person. Right. Okay. Anyway, I'm well, sure it's got we'll real mail. heavy again. I'm sure, we we'll get mail about this. You can always let us know what you think. Uh, uh, but, uh, sorry, remember that you have a discussion board post tomorrow to talk about your experience of science, whether that's here at Bethel, a college you've transferred for, if you want to harken back to high school or earlier. Um, which is kind of curious to hear uh, how you've experienced some of the questions we're talking about with the scientific revolution, the tensions, uh, whether you've resolved them, maybe you haven't resolved them. We're just uh, curious to hear. As always, please do respond to what other students say, you know, especially if you feel like you can, can fill in something expanded, extended. Don't just start a new thread that just repeats where we've already covered some ground. Sam, any last thoughts? Well, we don't have many museums less left, but it is important that you allow Flash. Mm -hmm.